this librarians here, and I just want to say thank you for coming out today um, to be to join us and have Ian speak. It's going to be a great program. Just a couple um, housekeeping. If you can, if you can mute your phone so there's no ringing during her program, that'd be great. Or if you have to take a phone call, if you can step out. And then um, the bathrooms are straight out and on the other side of the bulletin board. Okay. And um, she will take questions at the end. And I think that's it. All right. So let me turn this over to Donna. And thank you for coming out. Well, now you all know that I'm Donna, and I'm with the Oakwood Historical Society. I'm the chair of the Far Hill Speakers Series. And so on behalf of the Oakwood Historical Society, I'd like to thank you for coming today on such a beautiful day with the competition from the Bengals game. This is an outstanding oh. turn. <laughs> this is an outstanding turnout. So thank you all for, for doing this. Um, and thank you, Wright Library, for hosting us here in the, their community room. Um, I do have a few housekeeping and items. Anne has graciously brought copies of her book with her, and she will be selling them and autographing them after her lecture. So if you're interested, this is a great time to get an autograph and to talk with her personally. Um, just a couple of announcements. If you didn't see the table outside when you came in from the Historical Society, there are publications about the local area. Um, there's also a nice little reminder here of the two upcoming presentations. Um, the next one is um, on some of the Dayton area ghosts and legends. Sarah, Co Sarah Koshal is going to be talking about some research that she's done um, that are, is now part of her brand new book. Um, but some really interesting stories if you haven't seen and heard her talk. And then in November, Ken Suri, who uh, is, has worked for some healthcare companies. And in doing the work, he came across a lot of veterans and was hearing their stories and recognized that this is something special to be captured and told. And so he's written a book, but in November, when he comes to talk to us on the 19th, he's going to share with us some stories specifically to Dayton and Oakland veterans. He's going to talk about some of the orphans that were brought here from England and stayed here during the war. So it's going to be another fascinating uh, discussion. So enough said about no uh, little bits and pieces of housekeeping. Now, this is the best part. Because <laughs> today I have the pleasure to introduce to you Anne Hagedorn. Anne's the author of six books, the most recent one, Sleeper Agent, if you haven't seen it. And you notice Anne is wearing red and black to uh, help match this. Um, it's the story of a so an American-born Soviet agent, George Koval. And because he was American-born and because he was back and forth, it was amazing some of the things that he was able to do in terms of finding intelligence for the Soviets. So, um, as you will find out as Ian talks about it, Kobo was a member of a successful, actual rather large spy network of Soviets to gain information on the highly classified technology being developed by the Americans to create the first atomic bomb. During his time in the U.S., as a Soviet spy, Covell spent a lot of time here in Dayton. And uh, in her book, she was limited in what she could talk about in Dayton because she wanted to tell a whole story. So today you're going to hear some stuff that's not in the book about Covell's time here in Dayton. So just a brief background, Anne has been a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. She's taught classes at several wonderful journalism schools to include Northwestern and Columbia. She holds degrees from Denison, Columbia, and because of the <clears throat> season of the year, she also has a master's from that school up north. That starts with an M. I won't say what it ends with. Yeah. <laughs> Having four brothers, four uncles that played for us state. Varsity, I got it, I can't say it. Um, so, one really nice thing about Anne, I think we should share with the community here in Oakwood is, of course, she grew up in Oakwood, but um, in lieu of her honorarium, today she was kind enough to ask that we make donations not only to the right library in her name, but also to the Brunner Literacy Center. If you're not familiar with Brunner, it's over in the Trotwood area, and they work with adults as well as children to make sure they know how to read. And that's part of what she saw when she was down in Oak Ridge and recognized that literacy really is a significant issue and problem. So, all that said, 
We are glad to have Annie here today. So please welcome her. Well, I'm honored to be here, of course. Um, and thank you all for attending the event. Like Donna said, uh, there was a lot of competition today. So <laughs> I really appreciate you all coming. Uh, and thank you, Donna, for helping to make this happen. And also, thanks hugely, equally hugely, to the right library. Books surely have the power to bring people together. They are, I see that books as magic portals in a way uh, that connect us to each other, uh, as well as to the past and to the present with hopes for the future. I always say when I'm in this library, it was here many years ago that I fell in love with storytelling and with books. There's a line in the play Matilda that perhaps says it all, and every time I walk in this library, I think about why, without stories, we are eating machines with shoes. <laughs> so, uh, so today I'll discuss my latest book, uh, Sleeper Agent, and offer you a glimpse into its research significance, challenges, surprises, and most of all, its connection to Dayton. Uh, first, I'll do the elevator pitch. I, I work with the Simon & Schuster nonfiction team, and we always have to write an elevator pitch. Uh, and I always say, is this for a skyscraper or for a two-story condo? Uh, uh, anyhow, this is somewhere in between. But <clears throat> anyhow, it sort of uh, captures uh, the, the uh, details and perhaps importance of the book, but very quickly, uh, Sleeper Agent is the biography of the only Soviet military trained intelligence officer to have full security clearance in America's top secret project to build the first atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, of course. His name was George Kogel, and he was a U.S. Army corporal, born and raised in Iowa, in Sioux City, who charmed everyone he met. Blending into American culture, he loved baseball, was a Yankees fan, and he could reel off the history and stats of every big league picture. He played bridge. He belonged to two bowling leagues when he was undercover in New York, and he could recite verses from Walt Whitman and from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He was also, by several accounts, quite the ladies' man. All the while, he was sending atomic secrets to Moscow to help build their first atomic bomb, and he got away. So that's the elevator pitch. Uh, Sleeper Agent, as we see my books, is in the genre of narrative nonfiction, which is all about using literary techniques to tell true stories. So it requires the research and fact-checking of nonfiction and the literary structures of fiction a necessary melding of two skill sets. I consider it my job as a narrative nonfiction writer to seek the truth and using the facts unearthed from thorough research to engage readers through the art of storytelling. I dare say that it's more than a job. It's really a calling. Uh, my quest is always to find the most compelling narrative that will bring alive for the general reader, all the issues and individuals at the core of the book's topic. Often in events like this, I'm asked, how do you choose your topics? How did you uh, decide to write a biography of this Soviet spy? So usually, uh, first, it, it, it must be, a to the topic must have significance. It, it uh, especially, uh, it could be in danger of being missed, of falling through the cracks. It must have literary potential. It must be doable research-wise, of course. And it must have general reader appeal. It must be a fresh narrative. And perhaps most importantly, it must rouse the author's writerly passions. <clears throat> so first I choose the topic, then find the best narrative to bring it alive for the reader. 
That's the usual sequence. Though this time with sleeper agent, I discovered a remarkable story first, one that grabbed me from the start, and clearly in part because of my uh, uh, curiosity about the tie to Dayton. It all began with a 92-year-old gentleman I was interviewing for a topic in 2016. This was one of those topics I was uh, exploring for the po a possible book. Uh, it was intellectually important. It was in danger of falling through the cracks, but lacking a compelling narrative. I, I simply could not find the story that would lure the general reader into the depth of the topic. And the man I was interviewing <laughs> clearly sensed my frustration. He also knew that I had grown up in Dayton because I had learned about him through uh, a friend in Dayton. And so toward the end of the interview, uh, he asked if I knew about the secret site in Dayton tied to the highly secretive Manhattan Project. A while ago, he said someone had told him that a Soviet spy worked there during World War II. Perhaps the spy even lived and worked in the same neighborhood where I had spent my childhood, he said, that being Oakwood, of course. <clears throat> For a while or so, after the interview, uh, I continued my pursuit, you know, never give up pursuit of details for the other topic, but I was brimming with uh, curiosity. So I took time off to explore what the gentleman had told me. He had not given me a name. That was a problem. <laughs> and so I was very skeptical. Uh, it could easily have been a rumor. Uh, spy stories are so often embellished uh, or not even true. And so a great mix of skepticism and curiosity spurred me on. So first I made a few calls and I checked some details on the internet, which is, you know, what I always tell students, go to archives, go to libraries, you know, <laughs> don't depend on uh, digitized uh, collections on the internet. But that was the first thing I did, <laughs> I confess. And I found a 2007 New York Times story about a World War II Soviet spy whose name was George Kobel. The article focused on Vladimir Putin giving a posthumous award to Kobel for helping the Soviets speed up the development of their first atomic bomb. Voila, there was a mention of both Oakwood and I mean, Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge and Dayton. So next I made three lists. What seemed to be known about the spy, which what was clearly unknown about the spy, and I would have to reveal if telling the Koval story, and where there might be helpful archives, much needed primary sources. Then came what I referred to as the flight plan, a schedule for early research. This included calling the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press to gain wisdom about the latest ways to best use the Freedom of Information Act uh, to acquire FBI reports, uh, et cetera. That was very important, as was the 10-day visit to the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, plus some invaluable interviews in the D.C. area. Uh, the D.C. trip was a truly a turning point. From then on, as a few people in this audience today can definitely confirm, I barely took a day off from the process of finding letters, journals, postcards, news clips, yearbooks, photos, maps, tax records, uh, property records, ship manifests, passports, arrest records, application forms, even inscriptions in books, and thousands, uh, nearly 5,000 pages of FBI reports. So do read the acknowledgement section <laughs> of the book and, uh, you know, at your leisure, sit down and read the source notes. <laughs> Very proud of the source notes. Uh, though most people don't read them probably, but uh, but at any rate, uh, the sort of kind of reveal some of the adventure of uncovering the story. There was also the regimen of reading uh, <coughs> secondary sources about the various topical domains, such as uh, the Soviet espionage tactics and networks in 1930s and 1940s America, 
and the timelines of the making of the atomic bombs in the United States and in the Soviet Union. Of course, there were many readings on nuclear science, especially about the element polonium, including a 400-page document that was a, a tremendously helpful find uh, on polonium published by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1956. This was especially helpful in understanding what was happening in Dayton when Kobo was there here uh, from mid-June 1945 to mid-February 1946. With all of this reading and digging in pursuit of putting together the pieces of Kobo's life, it was clear that the who and the when were doable on the challenges list. I was soon confident about that, but for it to be a true biography, the why, the what, and the how had to be fleshed out. Not so easy to find such details when you're researching the life of a spy. They don't leave breadcrumbs for biographers, especially a spy who was never caught. And thus, uh, there are no trial transcripts uh, to refer to. Still, it was doable. I firmly believe that. And so I went ahead with it. And it was also rather inspiring because of those challenges and uh, what I sensed would be quite an adventure. Kobo was, as it turned out, a perfect sleeper agent, which by the way, as everyone in this audience I think knows, uh, is defined as a spy without legal diplomatic cover, one who blends into everyday life in the target country, working in normal jobs, in this case, at an electronics shop on West 23rd Street in Manhattan while living in the Bronx, and then uh, being a corporal in the U.S. Army during the war, uh, which was an excellent cover for his work at Oak Ridge and here in Dayton, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and here in Dayton. Like all spy stories, uh, the book hopefully gives readers the ex expected intrigue of espionage detail. Uh, the code names, Kobo used two, Delmar and Agent D. His handler went by Faraday. He was an electro uh, electronics uh, uh, specialist, so he went by Faraday. Uh, two fellow spies went by Clyde and Achilles. The crucial element polonium was called Postum. Uh, there were the various uh, New York City cover shops, the main one being that uh, West 23rd Street shop called Raven Electric. Plus, there were apartments in the Bronx, the handler and the park benches he used for connecting with sources, uh, the courier at the Soviet consulate in Manhattan, etc. But the book goes beyond that. Uh, for the biography, I hope for all of you readers, uh, really delves into the psychology of the spy, uh, showing the hopes, fears, and beliefs that influenced his decisions and provoked his commitments. I wanted to immerse the reader into the historical context in which the spy functioned and to basically deepen the themes and significance of what is a uh, usual, typical spy story. So among the underlying themes, uh, the book does expose the backlash of bigotry, the persistence of anti-Semitism in history in America and Russia, basically the human cost of oppression. Though his self-designed tapestry of lies and half-truths depict the true traitor, Kobo was also a very dedicated scientist. And he was a survivor of anti-Semitism in both Russia and America, someone who knew the human costs of oppression. And when you read about the anti-Semitism in both countries, you see the ambivalence of it. Both nations used his scientific expertise, and in both he experienced an onslaught of anti-Semitism. The Koval narrative uh, also thematically transcends the de debates about the scale of Soviet espionage in wartime America by turning the reader's attention to the scapegoating, the political opportunism, and the bigotry that blurred the vision of what was really happening regarding the Soviet spy networks in the United States, which is probably why one of the several reasons we didn't grow up uh, reading history books 
uh, with chapters on George Coble. <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover knew there were such networks. He was right about that, but he hunted in the wrong territories. And for example, he thought all members of the Communist Party USA had to be spies, but look at Kobel. He belonged to bowling leagues, not the Communist Party USA. And he mingled with his scientist peers in an electrical engineering honorary fraternity, not with his fellow travelers as his espionage peers were called. So whether in New York City or at Columbia University, where he took courses, or City College of New York, he got another degree at Oak Ridge or in Dayton, he very smartly blended in. In general, uh, sleeper agent answers uh, long lingering questions about the life of this Soviet spy, brings to light many new details, it reveals why he was undetected, and it shows there were no coincidences. Um, as a source of mine from years ago, when I covered uh, federal courts at the, for the uh, Wall Street Journal, an attorney actually uh, told me that when I asked him about what are the best ways to investigate a story or a case, he said, use timelines and chronology and always investigate what appear to be coincidences. Never accept the concept of a coincidence. So one good example of that in Sleeper Agent was Kogel's enrollment at Columbia University shortly after he returned to America as a Red Army trained spy. That fact was simply a line in one of the FBI files. A line without any context. Uh, when I called the registrar at Columbia, there was no record of his having enrolled or taking a course uh, because actually he took his courses at something called the University Extension in 1941. And so that was not uh, available at the time. And uh, so it's a great example of what could appear to be a detail of little significance and not researchable, basically, but with some study and mainly timelines about what was happening then in nuclear physics, it becomes far more important than someone taking chemistry courses at an Ivy League school because he loved science or wanted to make friends at his new home in New York City. Uh, and to be sure, by the time Kogel's uh, enrollment in 1941, Columbia had become a magnet for some of the most highly regarded physicists and chemists in the world, some destined to play stellar roles uh, in the upcoming production of the first atomic bomb. And uh, there had been uh, a very detailed front page article in the New York Times, I think it was on in May of 1940 about what was happening at Columbia in physics. And that was an article, as the FBI uh, reports would show, that his handler would definitely have seen, because by several accounts in those files, his handler read two publications each day, The Daily Worker and The New York Times. Another very memorable detail uh, is Koval's job at the Dayton and Oak Ridge sites uh, of the Manhattan Project. Uh, in the records and documents, it's fairly simple to find the fact that Koval, when he was here and when he was at Oak Ridge, worked as a health physicist. Uh, and but exactly, uh, I mean, that word health physicist is in many different documents on some applications, et cetera, et cetera. But what does that mean? You know, what does that mean on a daily basis? Uh, and that was never uh, explained in any of the uh, files or reports or documents I could find until I got to the Oak Ridge archives. And there's a room in at the public library in Oak Ridge called the Oak Ridge Room. And in there, I found huge files, um, probably, you know, as uh, wide and long as that table uh, uh, about the health physics department. 
um, at uh, for the Manhattan Project, which was created at Oak Ridge, uh, where, by the way, the fuels for the atomic bomb were processed and sent to Los Alamos, which was where uh, the bomb was designed and built. Health physicists were trained to measure levels of radiation contamination. And so such work required routines, daily routines, that gave access to the um, uh, health physicists to confidential and secret information. In fact, most if not all information pertaining to health physics during Kobel's tenure at Oak Ridge and in Dayton was classified. Health physicists had to learn the basic chemical properties of the radioactive materials they were monitoring. <laughs> they were asked to present uh, uh, whenever it, it, it has to be present, uh, at least two had to be present whenever repair work was done on any equipment in the plants. And no shipment could leave the sites without the approval of the health physics department. So health physics uh, physicists uh, conducted routine surveys of all offices and labs as they checked for signs of contamination. Three important steps for the health physics workers, as noted in their training manuals, quote, know all operations in your area, be alert to changes, make thorough surveys, unquote. And I found, as I said, many training manuals in those files. So you have to put yourself in the place of George Koval becoming a health physicist and having a job like that. That is uh, uh, quite uh, helpful for a Soviet spy, I would say. But uh, finding such details uh, throughout the adventure of the research are what I call the aha moments. Uh, at the National Archives, I think I actually uttered out loud aha when the archivist discovered a very helpful 471-page file uh, about Kobel. And I must have been humming ahas when I walked the streets of Manhattan and the Bronx to map out exactly where Kobel and his quote-unquote fellow travelers had worked and lived. But of course, the adventure of finding the details of Kogel's time in Dayton uh, was brimming with aha moments. And clearly this was one of the details in his life that drew me to the study story from the start. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, look at your copies of Sleeper Agent, chapter nine is devoted to Dayton. And, uh, uh, my copy of Speakeration is actually devoted <laughs> to the inventor of Post-its. <laughs> but at any rate, yeah. So chapter nine uh, is devoted to Dayton and what Kobel did during his nearly eight months here. The research and writing a chapter that focused on Dayton was, like I said, truly one of my favorite parts of the book. I really wanted to do more than uh, that one chapter, but, you know, I'm working, I was working with a a uh, very broad uh, uh, narrative, uh, broad in scope. And so, uh, uh, and he was here for eight months. So it was, you know, but uh, at the very beginning, uh, in my first draft, my chapter on Dayton was huge. And uh, I have to confess that I actually felt like a PR agent for the city of Dayton mm -hmm. and its marvelous history, mm -hmm. especially when I wrote the Dayton background, noting all of its many inventions. You know, in 1900, there were had been uh, more patents per capita in Dayton than any other city in the nation. I'm sure you all know that. And so I called it, in that first draft, America's startup capital for much of the 20th century. And in the first draft, I had long paragraphs with the list of inventions. Airplane, engine starter, step ladder, cash register, pop top cans, puppy bicycles, the barcode, Cheez-Its, and even ice trays with levers. So uh, then my editor graciously reminded me that unless Kobel was directly involved in such details, I really had to <laughs> move that proud list to the source notes. Uh, and I saw what he meant. 
So uh, at least now everyone on my wondrous SNS team knows about the greatness of Dayton. Uh, back to Koval. So while he was in Dayton, he lived first on Main Street in a boarding house. And then uh, he, he actually came from Oak Ridge with uh, one of his fellow uh, health physicists. Two of them were uh, transferred to from Oak Ridge to Dayton. Uh, and so they both rented rooms in that boarding house. Next, he moved to a house at 827 Grand Avenue. And as always, he had a girlfriend. Always, he had a charm on his arm. He dated different women at every stage of his so-called eight-year business trip in 1940s America. That's another thing that I had a lot about <laughs> in my first draft and had to sort of cut it back because it really wasn't about, uh, you know, uh, a James Bond uh, sleeper agent. It was really about... <clears throat> very serious Soviet spy, so uh, so there are only a few, and it, luckily I kept the one, uh, the women in, at Oak Ridge in Dayton, um, and one of them in New York, that was good. Uh, since the book was released, I've learned a lot more about the women. I even heard from a 98-year-old gentleman who had double dated with Koval at Oak Ridge and who went on a week-long furlough with him to New York City in May or early June of 1945, right before Koval was transferred to Dayton. And that that is an interesting story in and of itself that we won't have time to get into today, but that was actually a, a very helpful detail when the gentleman called me because uh, once I uh, went through all the timelines, et cetera, et cetera. I figured out that that, uh, especially the timelines with his handler and the courier for his handler, that that was exactly when he went to deliver uh, certain uh, reports to be sent to the Soviet Union. Uh, anyhow, uh, I learned from another source that Kobo had requested a transfer to the Dayton site right after it was known in Oak Ridge, likely among the health physicists, uh, that the method of processing polonium that was an experiment at the X-10 facility at Oak Ridge, uh, where, by the way, George George's girlfriend in um, Oak Ridge worked, uh, that that was an experiment, that the experiment at the X-10 facility at Oak Ridge for synthesizing uh, polonium, instead of extracting it naturally, uh, uh, it was going to be conducted in Dayton. So in the book, you'll read about the importance of polonium. Uh, in fact, I, I was going to focus uh, my next book on the epic saga of polonium. And uh, maybe someday I'll still do that, but another topic has come along. I'm just fascinated by the topic and uh, the element and the importance of polonium in the neutron producing mechanism that would release neutrons at exactly the right moment uh, to ignite the chain reaction. So what we're talking about is the trigger or the initiator. Um, so uh, I do believe also uh, as an aside that, and I've learned this from other lectures and uh, just uh, information in the last few years since the book has come out, that um, I think polonium uh, is, uh, has been confused with plutonium in some of the general references, uh, especially on the internet. So the polonium and what was happening here in Dayton is really was crucial to the atomic bomb. And uh, yeah, I hope that a uh, sleeper agent has <clears throat> opened a couple doors regarding that. But anyhow, uh, the and uh, to refresh your memory about uh, polonium, I thought I would just read uh, a quick uh, uh, description uh, that uh, discovered by Marie Curie in 1898 and named for Poland for homeland, polonium is one of the most toxic substances known. 
particles emitted by polonium can damage organic tissue if inhaled or ingested, and the scientists and technicians in Dayton would eventually be working with the largest amounts of polonium ever produced. Silvery with a soft as cream cheese look, polonium, one of the rarest elements, was very difficult to produce. By 1943, in fact, no weighable quantities of the pure element had ever been isolated. So, uh, anyhow, the X-10 facility at Oak Ridge, as well as the facility in uh, uh, Hanford, Washington, were experimenting on a method to synthesize polonium by irradiating the element bismuth. And by late spring 1945, that turned out to be uh, the most efficient way to produce the polonium, uh, which, as I said, was so immensely crucial for the trigger of the bomb. So such a realization changed the processing at the Dayton site, and that increased the need for more health physicists in Dayton who were knowledgeable about that newly discovered process to synthesize polonium. How it was made in Dayton until that point is fascinating too. Uh, it was to extract it naturally from lead dioxide residues. Between November 1943 and May 1945, 70,000 pounds of lead dioxide residues were shipped to Dayton in truckloads from a radium refinery in Port Hope, Ontario, in Canada, of course, which was extracting from uh, Canadian and African uh, uranium ores. However, only, now listen to this, take notes on this, uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 milligrams of polonium could be produced from six metric tons of the Port Hope lead dioxide. Note that there are 2,204.6 pounds in the metric ton. <laughs> if you do the math here, uh, that amounts to 1.65 milligrams of polonium. Think about that. This will be on your multiple choice test, <laughs> by the way. Uh, hardly enough. So by late spring 1945, Dayton discontinued this process as Oppenheimer was full, Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer was fully committed to using the new experimental method of synthesizing the cloning. Only the bombarded uh, irradiated bismuth sent from Hanford, Washington, and Oak Ridge then purified in Dayton and sent to Los Alamos uh, would be used. Note that it took five days for the uh, irradiated uh, bismuth at X10 to be cooled and transported to Dayton, add 25 more days for the polonium extraction and purification processes. Uh, what, the, what would happen is the ir irradiated uh, bismuth would decay into polonium 210. Uh, so one month basically uh, to get it to Los Alamos. By mid-May, Oppenheimer's previous request for monthly shipments of the purified polonium had switched to weekly from Dayton. That's intense pressure, I would say. By June, when Coble and the other health physicists were transferred from Oak Ridge to Dayton, there were daily communications between Dayton and Los Alamos that showed how hugely crucial the work in Dayton was. There is a wonderful quote. Uh, after writing this lecture, I was skimming through my own book and uh, saw this wonderful quote. This is from uh, two wonderful quotes, actually. One from Charles Thomas's biographer, who was his granddaughter. Uh, her book is over there on the table, uh, Polonium in the Playhouse, I think it's called. Anyhow, she talked about um, uh, the quantities and delivery dates were set and then quickly changed, showing, quote, the immense importance of the polonium and the immense pressure on scientists in Dayton. Then another quote from a Dayton Project historian, some deadlines were so close that an employee would be sent to talk with the courier and to keep him occupied while the final touches were put on the packages.
Interesting. <laughs> so, and uh, the uh, before we leave the uh, biographer of Charles Thomas, uh, we must note uh, the brilliance of Charles Thomas, who oversaw all chemistry in the Manhattan Project, though continuing to live in Dayton. Uh, Oppenheimer wanted him, I think, to move out to Los Alamos. He did not want to leave Dayton. He was married to a Talbot and was responsible for bringing the Talbot Playhouse on board as a colonial making facility. And he was the director of the Central Research Department at Monsanto. So he directed the development of the colonial in Dayton, pending what would be called the, uh, the, the Dayton Project. It was not uh, Albert, it was not uh, connected openly to the Manhattan Project because Oppenheimer uh, insisted on uh, keeping it highly secretive and not directing, directly tying it to the Manhattan Project. So it was tied to Monsanto, which signed a contract with the Manhattan Project, so with the government. So uh, that's an interesting detail. They're all in the book. Uh, anyhow. Back to Koval, he learned about what was happening regarding polonium in Dayton in two ways. His job at Oak Ridge and the woman he was dating at Oak Ridge who worked at the X-10 site. Uh, one can only imagine uh, the conversations on his dates with a woman who worked in that facility, though he had to have known X-10 fairly well uh, as a health physicist he could easily have learned more from a girlfriend, <laughs> uh, especially at a place where secrecy was so intense. At Oak Ridge, by the way, there were even unofficial security agents, workers who were on the lookout for suspicious behavior, and if they noticed it, they were instructed to send details in coded fake business letters to an equally fake company in Knoxville, Tennessee, called Acme Credit Corporation. <laughs> uh, one source told me the same system existed in Dayton. <laughs> I love this part of the research because I did so much digging trying to find the Acme Credit Corp, uh, you know, version in Dayton, but I've not yet uncovered it, so maybe one of you will. <laughs> but at any rate, in Dayton, uh, the woman Koval dated was Janet Fisher, who was interviewed by FBI agents in 1956. She told them that Koval played bridge with her family every Sunday, and that she and her sister, Marge, worked in Unit 4 uh, of the Dayton site. That place many of you know about, of course, on Renegade Road, what was once the Talbot Playhouse. And she told agents that her mother wasn't especially fond of him because he would not talk about his family. The mother was suspicious of him, uh, but it apparently never occurred to her that uh, he could have been a Soviet spy or that he was lying quite frequently. He did tell Janet, as he did all of his girlfriends and most friends in New York, that he grew up in Cleveland in an orphanage. <laughs> Nothing about his parents, his two brothers, or his wife of 12 years, who was alive and well back in the Soviet Union. <laughs> uh, there were other women. Uh, the one he dated in New York City from March 1948 until he left America in October 1948, and she later connected with the woman from Dayton, who lived in France when the FBI interviewed her. Uh, both talked about the polonium, which of course made Koval so invaluable to speeding up the Soviets' project. Among the details, uh, when I do lectures like this, people want to know what can be proven that he sent. Uh, well, that, there's a lot about that in part three that he sent to the Soviet Union information. Uh, the Oak Ridge plant structures and layouts worker numbers, fuel volumes, shipments of plutonium sent to Los Alamos, um, all of, a, a lot about plutonium, which was uh, very helpful to 
the Soviet project because the spy Klaus Fuchs had sent information about plutonium from Los Alamos. And so Kobold's, uh, because plutonium was, uh, plutonium-239 was created in the x facility in Oak Ridge. So he sent the same information to the Soviets and that gave Kurchatov, who was the head scientist at Igor Kurchatov, uh, head scientist at the Soviet's atom bomb project, uh, he could then believe what Petler Fuchs had sent. So what uh, Koval sent about plutonium was very important. Um, and uh, the recipe for the synthesized polonium, and when you think of how long it took, uh, for this country to uh, figure out exactly how to create uh, a, a helpful volume of polonium uh, that really had speeded up the Soviet uh, uh, creation of their own bomb. Uh, and uh, the increase in production at the Dayton facilities he sent that and the many radiation safety developments at both Oak Ridge and Dayton. And there is a part in the book uh, by uh, a couple of quotes by scientists saying that how helpful it would have been for this Soviet uh, project to know about the radiation safety uh, methods. And George, George Koval wrote several articles in scientific uh, publications about that. And one was published, I think, in June of 1945. Anyhow, Kurchatov would say later that Soviet espionage in Canada and America accounted for 50% of the Soviet project's success, um, speeding up the process uh, with the help of someone like George Koval. In Sleeper Agent, I have answered numerous questions about the man from Iowa, whom the New York Times had called one of the most important spies of the 20th century in that article 16 years ago. And I hope that my research in this book uh, have opened doors to even more details for writers in the future. As I've said, when I've been on the road for this book, I've learned all kinds of things that I didn't know uh, that I didn't uncover, things that were basically intersections of timelines or uh, uh, little details like where the Del Delmar uh, uh, code name came from, things like that. Lots of information came out of uh, a few, several days of, I think I was at Oak Ridge for about a week doing events. But alas, without being able to interview Koval, there are still answers that can never be answered, uh, still questions that can never be answered, uh, such as what I wrote in the prologue about his last moments in America, uh, the country of his birth. So I think I'm going to read you that. Uh, I need to ask Donna how much time I have. I wanted to read you what seems to be everyone's favorite uh, uh, little among the favorite stories uh, in the book, and one that was extremely hard to uncover, uh, and that's how he got back into America in 1940, after leaving America in 1932 with his family, coming back as a trained GRU spy in 1940. So I'm gonna read you that, and then at first I'm just gonna read you uh, this, uh, uh, these last few paragraphs of the prologue, because this is one of the kind of haunting, uh, unanswered questions. There are several, um, but this one, I suppose, uh, will always stick with me, and I, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you, <laughs> uh, as I'm sure many other people were, like J. Edgar Hoover, who tried to extradite him, but um, at any rate, so, uh, though documents and interviews would someday expose parts of the truth about Koval's escape from America, some questions would never be answered, like what he was thinking as he watched the New York skyline diminish and the ocean's vast expanse draw near. 
Was he remembering the last time he had left America in May 1932 with his parents and his two brothers on a ship leaving from Pier 54, <clears throat> bound eventually for the Soviet Union? Were the details of his father's stories about being a Russian immigrant and seeing America for the first time in 1910? Did he have the manner of a professional, lacking last-minute hesitations or sentimentality as the ship passed by the great statue symbolizing the freedoms of the country that was his birthplace? And did he struggle to push back all thoughts of what and whom he was leaving behind? By November, Koval would be living in the Soviet Union in Moscow with his wife of 12 years, and he would soon reunite with his 65-year-old father, at Abram, and his mother, Ethel, then 58, and one of his brothers, Isaiah. What he told them about his past eight years in America on his quote-unquote business trip for Soviet military intelligence is unknown. But one certain fact is that George Kova left the U.S. just in time, and as anyone who knew him would likely say, his timing was always nearly perfect. So now uh, I would like to read you this, uh, uh, how he got back. This was uh, very difficult to find. Um, as uh, were the uh, records of his parents coming over in 1910, they were not with the Ellis Island records, they were with the Galveston, Texas records, because his parents came through Galveston, Texas in 1910, who was part of what was called the Galveston Movement. Very interesting, and thanks to an archivist at the Center for Jewish History in Manhattan, um, uh, who knew I was sitting there trying to find all these records in the Ellis Island records, and uh, he asked me, could he help me? And I said, I can't find his name anywhere. And he said, well, maybe he came through Galveston. And I said, Galveston? <laughs> and then in the next 15 minutes, he came out with one of those wonderful library uh, uh, wagons with, you know, bookshelves, <laughs> moving bookshelves on wheels uh, that were filled, that was filled with information about the Galveston movement. Very interesting. So, uh, but no one could really, uh, at the Jewish Center, uh, no one anywhere uh, could find the information on how he got back into America uh, in the fall of 1940. Uh, you have to remember, he left with his parents, and they had a, in 1932, and so his name was not on the passport. It was his father and mother's name. Uh, it was a family passport. So... This was not easy. So I had a wonderful Russian translator uh, at Miami University, a brilliant woman uh, who helped me just uh, really dig, dig, dig to try to find out how he got back in. And so uh, we did. Um, and uh, here are the few paragraphs. And this is, um, I, I, I like this part of the book, and I, I had an editor at the Wall Street Journal, wonderful human being, but he always said, never fall in love with your own writing. So <laughs> I never have. I, I believe in humility. Uh, humility breeds excellence, and so uh, there it is. But I, I like this because it has humor in it, but it also has depth, and because it was so darn difficult to <laughs> find out. So uh, let me redo this, and then... We shall turn uh, the uh, uh, event over to questions. Um, one September night in 1940, somewhere in the East China Sea, mountainous waves were tossing a small cargo ship on which George Kovo was en route from Vladivostok, a port in the far southeast corner of the Soviet Union, on the way to San Francisco. Quote, we almost got into the center of a cyclone, he wrote in a letter to his wife, Mila. Quote, the rocking was huge and all books and furniture were falling on us as we fell off our beds, unquote. Crossing 4,554 nautical miles, the trip would take more than three weeks, adding to Koval's six-day 
5,772 mile train journey from Moscow to Vladivostok. During the calm days when the winds were a total delight, uh, Koval wrote that he played chess or dominoes with the ship's captain and read stories to the captain's nine-year-old daughter who called him Uncle Grisha. Mm -hmm. Bonding with the captain's family on such a long passage would prove essential when the ship docked in America. Though he carried a fake passport, Koval planned to help unload the cargo and then slip away, possibly to a meeting place in the San Francisco Bay area, where he would be given whatever was needed for his continuing travels. Because it was a cargo ship, the Customs Patrol didn't process at that time entry papers for crew members uh, returning in a quick turnaround to Vladivostok. Still, U.S. officials conducted a seemingly thorough inspection of the ship, during which Koval hid in a storage bench in the captain's quarters. Sitting on top of the storage bench were the captain, his wife, and his daughter. <laughs> the English-speaking inspectors asked to see identification documents for the captain and his family, a process that apparently took longer than the little girl could tolerate. And so she looked up at her mother at one point and asked in Russian, will Uncle Grisha have to stay under the couch much longer? <laughs> the mother smiled, said nothing, <laughs> and continued to hold her daughter's hand while her husband focused uh, totally on the officials. The calm response of the mother and father, plus the fact that the inspectors likely knew little, if any, Russian, or were simply paying no attention to a little girl's exchange with her mother, saved the day for the Soviet spy. Soon, Koval was boarding a train to New York City. So, I shall close with that. And, uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope uh, you will learn something from this. Yes, thank you. So much. Yeah. Um, for those of you who have not read the book, and I have, so I can be honest when I say that it has been, it was a fascinating book. When I picked it up, I thought, okay, well, I know a little bit about this because my dad has spent some time in Oak Ridge and things like that. But there's so many facts packed in here. And when you think about the research that it took to find things that are so well hidden and be able to construct a factual story. It's just fascinating. So, so give a Thank you, Don. So, questions for Ann, please. And then after we're done with questions, she'll be delighted to sign books and answer other questions, of course. And if anyone on Zoom has questions, they can type it in as well. So you have a question. Oh, I, I, you, you're talking yes, about. I know you want. You have questions. Yes. I have a number, but I want. I hope people have a chance too. Yeah. Oh, you're, yes. But, tell people who you are. I'm, uh, I'm Bob Bowman from yeah. the Mount Laboratory yeah. Museum, That's and I've yeah. uh, given a number of talks on COBOL myself, and, and right. Manhattan That's Project, right. Manhattan Projects, and all these other things. So I'm kind of a sleeper agent myself. <laughs> I'm into your research, but I have been, I have pretty much read it. I even have a. A uh, friend in Russia who investigated publication of the publication that Koval did in the Soviet Union. Right. So yeah. I, I know. I, I do too. Public. I wonder if your guy knows my guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to talk. Mine's a professor of physics in the Urals. Oh, okay. Yeah, mine is at Mendel Lee Institute. So, okay. yeah. Anyway, yeah. one of the, one of the things we published. So, there's, so there's a number of things. But what? One, <laughs> but one question. Yeah. Then, yeah. And you were wrapping up. You said he wrote letters to his wife. Oh, yeah. You know, on the ship. Yeah, he did. Uh, do you have a, how much he stayed in touch with his wife for the nine years? Yeah, while he was being question. a playboy of the Western world? Yeah. So, well, an excellent question. And playboy, uh, let's start with playboy of yeah. the Western world. Uh, in my humble opinion, after uh, uh, connections with some people who were his students at yeah. Mendeley, yeah. uh, who were relatives yeah. in Russia, um, uh, he was a very loyal and true blue uh, husband, okay. and so I do believe that part of his cover was to look very American. You know, not only play baseball, you know, he was a shortstop, um, not only play baseball and not only belong to a bowling league, but always have a girlfriend. I mean, I think those girlfriends were uh you know purposely chosen I, I, i'm sure he cared about them they cared about him I, you know who knows uh but 
uh, he needed, like I said, a charm on his arm. That was part of his cover. He he just blended in so perfectly. Why would you question uh, uh, a guy who you know had no Russian accent, spoke perfect American, was had blended, grew up in the American culture, so he blended in perfectly. I mean, the GRU saw him as quite a gem, I'm sure. Uh, and so I think that's that's uh, the the point. But uh, for two of the girlfriends, he did talk about a future with two of them because that's in the FBI report. So that's uh, fact number one. Uh, was he loyal? And then what was the first part of your okay, the first question? thing? Is he wrote letters. To oh yeah, he wrote letters. I, I okay. So, okay. So that was something I was very curious about. Uh, on the ship, those letters uh, went to the captain, took them back to the Soviet Union and was told to give them to a certain person in uh, Vladivostok who then took them to Moscow. So we were able to find that. And then, you know, uh, he and his wife, and I think it's in the book, some of their communications, um, his brother was killed. Uh, one of his brothers was killed in uh, the fight against the Germans, uh, a very famous uh, Stalingrad, battle. Right. Mm -hmm. Stalingrad. Yes, right. Excellent. You get an A. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. No, but uh, yes. Uh, and he was killed. Um, and uh, so how George found out about that through one of the letters uh, from his wife. And those letters were, uh, you know, somehow moved through the Soviet consulate in New York City to the handler and then to George. So he did, they did communicate. Also, uh, she became quite ill at one point uh, during war. She was working in a very toxic yeah. factory. And uh, uh, he learned about that. And also, if you'll recall, he was told that he was only going to be there for two years and that his wife would be transported uh, to America. Uh, that never happened, and he was there for eight years. So uh, he tried the first time to come back in the spring of 1946 uh, because things were really heating up in terms of the HUA, the House Un-American Activities Committee, et cetera, et cetera. There were all the defectors, and um, in the fall of 1945, you know, the one in Canada in December 1945, and so uh, things were getting really uncomfortable, I think, for him, and so he started to try to get back, but there was a freeze uh, in communication in 1946, I think, into 1947, yeah. uh, in communication between... Uh, uh, in the espionage network. So in that period of time, they probably didn't communicate. Uh, but yeah, that's, um, and there, there are more details about that, I think, in the book, and I'm trying to think exactly where, but, uh, but anyhow, one of the things, uh, just like trying to find out uh, what was the fake company that people could write to in Dayton if they were suspicious of their co-workers, you know, I've never been able to find that. I mean, there's a list. I could send you the list of things I'm trying to find. Okay. Maybe you know those. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. But we should have a chat at some point. But yeah, so does that answer your question? Do you think? It does for now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope I get an A. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you might have said this, but George was here in Dayton for eight months. Yeah. He lived basically, let's call it Main Street downtown. Where did he work? Oh. Well, where he worked, uh, Unit 3 and Unit 4, you know, what, what's unique, and I was going to read you that paragraph, actually. I didn't want things to get too long, but um, what was unique about Dayton was that, uh, you know, all of the units that were part of uh, the, uh, well, the Manhattan Project uh, were all... Uh, you know, integrated. I mean, they were integrated. I mean, they were uh, part of the city. Uh, they were all, uh, one was on Third Street, one was in Oakwood. You know, they were all uh, sort of all part of, um, uh, they, they were not part of a separate, 
you know, uh, how many thousand acres uh, at Oak Ridge, uh, 70,000 acres or something. They weren't um, a town alone or Hanford or Los Alamos. They were part of the city. And so he worked in the one in Unit 3, which I think was on 3rd Street. It's, if you read the Daily News yeah. today, that the Manhattan yeah. building that they referred yeah. That's exactly yeah. the three. Yeah, and then he also, but he, and then he dated the woman who was working in Unit Four. So uh, the uh, he also had access to Unit Four because, like I said, as a health physicist, he had to have access to all of the facilities. But those facilities were uh, very separate. Uh, which makes uh, Dayton all the more interesting, in my opinion. Uh, you know, and also the details of transporting uh, the uh, lead dioxide residues from Canada in truckloads and taking them to uh, the Oakwood facility. You know, I mean, it's all you know, very interesting. But anyhow, yeah, so he worked mostly at Unit 3, uh, and I think, yeah, and then he also uh, worked at uh, Unit 4. Um, which is the Running Meat Play. Which is the, which is the Money Meat Play. The warehouse, the one you're talking Unit about, four. it's called the Manhattan. That's where they had the health physics lab. That's where they monitored the stuff. Yeah. They would collect at the other right. site. They would monitor it. That was a cold place. Right. Right. So they could run their instrument and, and check for... Right. And they were really looking for low levels of radiation. Right. Very low level. Right. And if you did it in the facility, you would have too much background. Right. Would, and so he would, they would take samples, and, right. and then he would then he would analyze them. So, he, yeah, so he, and that was in Unit 3 and in Unit 4. Yeah. yeah. Both of them handled that. Both of them handled that. So he was in both. But, you know, he also, uh, you know, had a girlfriend, and her sister uh, worked at Unit 4, which is the playhouse. Yeah, mm -hmm. on Running Me Road. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah, yeah. So, uh, any other questions? Yes. So, did you were you able to access any files from the Soviet Union? Like, I know when the Soviet Union collapsed, like KGB and stuff opened something up for a short window. Yeah. Were you able to find anything there? Uh, well, my wonderful Russian translator and researcher, she uh, did some digging in the uh, Russian. Uh, uh, atomic Ministry, Atomic Energy Ministry, and also, uh, you've got to look at the source notes. Yeah, I mean, but also we had contact with uh, a couple of scholars who had really studied this, and mm -hmm. uh, one who's now written a three volume biography of George Kobel. Mm -hmm. And because of things with Russia these days, I have not been able to maintain contact with him. So, uh, yeah, so uh, that, uh, I really like my uh, Russian translator, who is, if she ever hears this, she'll probably change, but I would love for her to translate what he wrote. Um, at least we should go through the source notes and see what he called. But also there was a biographer, um, who's noted in here, Vladimir Loto was his name, and he was uh, a GRU historian and a former GRU uh, officer, I think. And so he wrote a biography on the GRU that came out in, I think, 2002, that revealed Del Delmar, Agent D and Delmar, uh, and he, he did extensive digging in those archives. And so, uh, my translator translated that, and uh, we were able to get all kinds of information from um, uh, Vladimir Lota, whose work I, you know, uh, yeah, I thank him in, in the book, of course. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, yes and no. I mean, you know, via Vladimir Lota, via two other writers, uh, and and my Russian translators, wonderful work, uh, we were able to find uh, some fabulous details. But because of uh, COVID, uh, our big plan to go to Russia, yep. and my wonderful husband who took uh, years of Russian in college and was working on it really hard, uh, we were going to go. 
And I like to go where the story is. I wanted to walk down the streets, you know, go to mental leave, talk to people, uh, but we couldn't do it. So that, that was a bit frustrating. But um, at any rate, uh, so did the best we could. Yeah. One more quick question, yeah. and then if you have other questions, if you're willing to stay yeah, with sure. your books, then you can talk with her first. Yeah. Real quick, I was curious if anyone knew where he lived in West Oakland, and did the scientists actually live at the playhouse? No. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. No, and he never lived in Oakwood. Uh, he there lived on Grand there Avenue. There. Yeah. Yeah. He lived first on Main Street in a boarding house, and then he lived on Grand Avenue. So he never lived in 827 Oakland. Grand Avenue. Okay. No, I not, heard no. stories that he lived in West I know. Oakland. See, and that's, uh, you know, no proof of that. No, I know. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe he spent the night there or something. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No, no, we have to, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, well. Yeah. We had somebody who is uh, complimented your presentation, uh, and um, I have a question for you afterwards about that, but um, everybody was very pleased. Oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, reread and reposted posted <laughs> in, uh, uh, in honor of this, and, uh, you know, I will come back again maybe in a year, and uh, if I um, if people come to me and tell me things that uh, I'm very open minded about these things because I feel my I'm dedicated to writing you know taking on these topics bringing them alive and then hoping that the readers will uh, come to me with new information I mean that's that what we're supposed to do book. yeah. The what? I said you did that beautifully in this book. I mean, if Thank people you. can read it and you're just going to want to find out more. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Seriously. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so give me a call. You know, if you, <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, want, uh, if you have more details, especially that wonderful detail that I could never find, the, the fake publication in Dayton where uh, unofficial secret agents could send information about suspicious workers. But at any rate, so, uh, at any anyway, rate, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. So. I have the address. The address, no.